Imagine going on a daring expedition with your friend and you never see him again. Not only that, but you've got nothing to say to his family because your friend's dead body remains lost in the place where you went for an expedition. The guilt of it all, the sleepless nights, and the never-ending nightmares. A friend's life lost, an adventure gone wrong, a family with no closure. Is there a way to go back to life after you've been through something so life-altering? Roger Solari and his friend Martin Farr went on a trip to Agen Ashweth Cave in 1974. They were both experienced divers, but they pushed themselves too far, and that's when Roger had an unfortunate incident. Ogof Agen Ashweth, commonly known as Agen Ashweth, is one of Wales' most extensive cave systems. With almost 32.5 kilometers or 20.2 miles of passages, this is the longest cave system on the Liangatok Escarpment. Within the system, there are various round trips that can be taken, but all of them start with the short entrance series and the first boulder choke. Crawling is required for the long entrance passages, but the majority of the cave is made up of wide stream passages that are easy to navigate and do not require any special equipment. The Grand Circle includes the mainstream passage, which features four boulder chokes, or rock obstructed channels, and the southern stream passage, which is long, damp, and tedious. There are also the outer and inner circles, which include Turkey Streamway and Gower Pools in some formations. The round trip can take up to six hours, and some areas of the cave are prone to flooding. The sump at the third boulder choke quickly fills with water and in worse flood circumstances, navigating the second boulder choke and the small part of Turkey Streamway above Northwest Junction becomes difficult. Flooding makes Maytime in the lower mainstream inaccessible. Agen Ashweth has few formations in general. Agen Ashweth is also noteworthy because of the large number of bats that sleep there. The Wildlife and Countryside Act of 1981, the Habitat Regulations of 1994, and the EC Habitats Directive all provide strict protection for bats from disturbance. It's a crime to intentionally or recklessly disturb bats. Cavers should use caution to prevent causing disruption. The cave was originally reached via the Agen Ashweth entrance, but a guarded entry is now possible via the Ogoff Pont Gom entrance. This allows you to avoid an uncomfortable rift passage, which is now blocked by a pillar. Keys are accessible to those with appropriate permissions who must sign a book detailing the route to be taken upon entering the cave. There's no carbide allowed in the cave, and additional licenses are required for camping, blasting, or research. Let's talk a little bit about the history of rescues in South Wales. The South Wales Cave Rescue Team, or SMWCRT, was established in 1946 as a response to the growing activity around the Swansea and Neath Valleys. The team's first major incident occurred in 1951, when flooding trapped two cavers in a cave in the Swansea Valley. In the 1960s, a two-day rescue of an injured caver in Lethreed Swallet on Gower demonstrated the team's capabilities and professionalism to South Wales Police. The British Cave Rescue Council, or BCRC, was formed in 1967 to represent and support member rescue teams at national and international levels. The Gwent Cave Rescue Team, or GCRT, was formed in 1968 in response to major new cave discoveries in the Liangatok area of the Brecon Beacons. In the 1970s, a fatal diving incident in Agen Ashweth brought resources and personnel from both South Wales teams together, leading to the formation of an umbrella organization called the SWCRO in 1975. The former SWCC-based team relinquished the SWCRO title and expanded its remit to include other caving clubs in the region, becoming the West Brecon Cave Rescue Team, or WBCRT. In the 1980s, the combined efforts of SWCRO were put to the test with a major rescue in Agen Ashweth, which took over 50 hours and involved around 280 underground rescuers. In 1991, the WBCRT, formerly separated from the SWCC to become an independent rescue team, widened its membership and enabled the team to gain charity status. In 1992, the team's area of operation was extended to cover the mines of Mid Wales with new equipment trailers and a warden network. 
1998, work on a new advanced first aid course for cave rescue was completed, credited by the British Red Cross and the British Cave Rescue Council. It's now delivered annually for 9 of the 15 UK cave rescue teams and has become a national standard for cave rescue advanced first aid in the UK. At 2010, the team changed its name to the South and Mid Wales Cave Rescue Team. In 2011, the team supported the efforts of the Gleason Colliery Disaster, and in 2012, they joined other rescue teams and emergency services in the search for missing schoolgirl April Jones in the Machlinath area of Mid Wales. In 2020, a fundraising campaign supported a modernization program to update the team's stretchers, radios, and incident control equipment. In 2021, the team made headlines with the largest cave rescue the UK had ever seen, a 54-hour stretcher carry, an OFD from Quim Dwer to Top. Now back to our tragic story of Roger Solari. In 2005, a group of divers explored Aachen Ashweth in search of the mysterious link that leads to Darren Kalau. They began digging the inlet, revealing a 984-foot or 300-meter long tube in the system. The passageway is stunning, culminating in the corkscrew chamber. The cave's passageways stretch for more than 20.2 miles or 32.5 kilometers. When you enter the cave, you'll go through a short series at the entrance before reaching the first boulder choke. Within the cave, there are more round passages to explore. When you first enter the cave's extensive entrance pathways, you'll need to crawl until you reach the large passageways that are easily accessible even without any special diving equipment. The Grand Circle is one of the round excursions, is located near the main tunnel and has four boulder chokes, passages that are obstructed by rocks. The long, humid, and difficult Southern Stream Passage is another round passage within the Aganash Wef. You can also explore the cave's outer and inner circles as well. The Turkey Stream is one of those. It's a beautiful stream with pools. If you wish to explore those round passages, plan on spending roughly six hours per passage, and keep in mind that those spots are prone to flooding. If your expedition falls during the rainy season, you must use extreme caution. The waterway at the third boulder choke is usually full of water, and during a flood, it's inaccessible to the second boulder choke. During strong floods, the limited portion of Turkey Stream way beyond Northwest Junction also becomes inaccessible. In 1949, Brian Price and his colleagues were the first to study the cave. David Seagrove and Harold Hicken discovered the passages in 1950. They continued exploring until they reached the first boulder choke. The Hereford Caving Club advanced the exploration by breaking the initial boulder choke that had kept them from accessing the main part of the cave in 1957. In 1971 and 1972, John Parker and Jeff Phillips, together with others, explored the cave systems. John and Jeff uncovered 1,969 feet or 600 meters of a new passageway in 1972. They had recently added 1,476 feet or about 450 meters to the total length of the route downstream of the previously discovered sumps. However, John lost interest in this exploration and slacked off. Marlon Farr, who had been inspired by Parker's previous diving expeditions, continued his exploration from the point where he had stopped at Agen Ashwef. Martin began exploring the cave in 1973, and he and Roger Solari went on the cave's longest excursion in 1974. Roger was on this adventure when the awful tragedy occurred. Roger Solari is without a doubt one of the most gifted cavemen in the United Kingdom. He had done multiple dives in various locations, including Yorkshire, South Wales, and Ireland. When it came to cave diving, he was a dedicated and tough man. Roger was an introvert by nature, yet he was well-liked and respected everywhere he went. Nothing was too difficult for him, and he was always found pushing through to triumph. He began diving when he was 12 years old in his native forest of Dean. He grew so familiar with this woodland as a result of his continuous exploration that he knew its mysteries and geology. His scholarly research on the Forest Master system began. His intention was to write about the various caverns and mines found in this woodland region. He studied physics at Birmingham University and graduated with honors. Roger was the president of his school's Speleological Society. He founded the Cave Project Group and also belonged to the Forest Rescue Association. Roger Solari and Martin Farr entered the Agen Ashweth Cave on Saturday, June 15, 
1974. Martin Farr was a prominent cave diver and caver. He's one of the world's most recognized divers, and he's acquired phenomenal reputation in the cave diving community as a result of his incredible cave diving discoveries. Roger and Martin plan to investigate and develop the channels within the cave to continue from where one of the best divers, John Parker, had halted. Remember that in 1972, John Parker and Jeff Phillips discovered 1,476 feet, or about 450 meters, more quarter length than the previous length, totaling 1,969 feet, or 600 meters. Martin had already dived into this cave system a month before their adventure. Roger, however, was unable to attend due to a knee injury. During this research, he arrived at the spot where John Parker had left his exploration and was ecstatic because he discovered a massive passageway leading into the darkness. He dashed down the hallway to see where it ended. According to Martin, it was a tunnel that all cave divers hoped to discover. Unfortunately, he was unable to continue his expedition on this day due to a lack of oxygen in his tanks. One month later, in June 1974, Roger and Martin were preparing to go on a long journey. They were about to dive into the mainstream's downward stream, Sump 4. They each came with three air cylinders, boots, and a line reel. Everything went smoothly until they got to Sump 4. Martin was close behind Roger, who was leading the dive. Roger was carrying a 400-foot or 122-meter line reel. He was laying line with it. Martin, on the other hand, had a reel with a length of 1,000 feet or about 305 meters. During the dive, Roger mentioned that he was having sinus problems. However, Roger was not unfamiliar with the challenges that he was facing. He had previously encountered similar difficulties while diving. This trip was identical to one of those challenging ones. Martin suggested that Roger return if the situation did not resolve. Martin and Roger were diving together, but independently. That is, either of them could choose to return to the surface at any time. That was part of their dive strategy. Roger was keen to continue the exploration because it piqued his attention. When Roger's line ran out at about 400 feet, 122 meters down the sump, it was clear that they had reached a depth of 50 to 60 feet, or 15 to 18 meters, and that the channel was dropping further. Martin examined his pressure monitor and noticed that he was almost at his first third limit of air, and he chose to keep going. He was aware that Roger had a little less air in his tanks, and they communicated underwater that Martin would continue on his own and Roger should return. Martin continued up the deeper passage. He observed a gravel bank with a steep upward slope around 150 feet, or 45 meters later, just when he decided he should return to the surface. Martin examined his pressure gauge at this moment, only to discover that he was already far into his second third of air. Despite this, he ascended the slope, expecting to find an air pocket where he could breathe for a second. He proceeded higher and higher till he reached about three feet below the water's surface, but there was no airspace there. Martin had only a half bottle of air left, which he needed to get out of the cave. Martin had pushed the limits pretty hard this time and had swiftly made his way out. While walking out, he noticed Roger on the top of the passage at a depth of three feet. Martin indicated to him that it was time to return to the surface. Martin threw his reel to one side, but Roger clung to his line. They needed to get out because they were both out of air. Martin reached the deepest point and began to make his way back along the tunnel. However, due to his rapid climb, he experienced extreme discomfort in his ears. He waited on the line for a few minutes while clearing his ears, but Roger didn't answer. Martin realized he didn't have enough air to return down the tunnel and look for Roger, so he returned to the surface. Martin felt very relieved when he reached the surface. He waited a while, expecting Roger to return to the surface as well, but he didn't. He started to worry about what must have happened to him. He grew uneasy, but there was nothing he could do. He was out of breath. This was the main reason he couldn't wait for Roger in the cave, as any professional diver would. But now that he was out of the cave and Roger hadn't returned, he had no choice but to return to the cave with his air supply. He returned to the cave. He started pulling on the line, but it was slack. He discovered that the line had been cut around 30 feet or 9 meters after where the lines were linked, about 430 feet or 131 meters further. Martin didn't have enough air at this point. It was no longer safe for him, so he returned to the surface and waited endlessly for Roger to return. 
When John Elliott and his fellow divers returned from their nine-hour dive nearby that night, they encountered Martin, who informed them that Roger had yet to return from the fourth sump. They immediately notified the police and the cave rescue team about the situation. John Parker had also been summoned. During the time of the accident, he was one of the best available. They attempted to dive to rescue Roger's body on Sunday evening, but were impeded by poor visibility caused by heavy rain in South Wales. They were there all night but had to call it quits when they couldn't find him. They waited for several days. They returned the next Thursday. The search crew included 11 divers, including John Elliott, John Parker, and Colin Edmund, a diver from the area. They were returning to the final sump where they had last seen Roger. They took it upon themselves to locate the body and return it to the surface. While others waited on the surface, John Parker and Colin Edmund entered the cave. After reaching the third sump, Colin returned to the surface, stating that visibility was still very bad. Parker resumed his hunt on his own. Parker was equipped with four air cylinders for the dive. He had made it down to the fourth sump and had placed more than 500 feet or 152 meters of line, despite the fact that he was still diving in low visibility. Roger's body was nowhere to be discovered despite his best efforts. Parker had returned to the surface around three and a half hours after Colin had. After a brief meeting, the ten divers agreed that the search should be called off to minimize further risks. They'd spent ten and a half hours looking for a long-lost diving companion, Roger Solari. Unfortunately, they were unable to recover Roger's body from Agen Ashwef, and what happened to him inside the cave remains a mystery to the cave diving world to this day. One might suppose he became entangled and cut the line from the reel as a result. But that's not all there is in enclosed spaces like caves and forests that are undiscovered and no human has been in there before. There are so many questions no one's been able to answer. What actually happened to that body? Why was it never found even after days of looking for it? Where did it go? How can a human body just disappear like that? Did it disappear or was it devoured? No one has the answer. All of his diving companions and members of his cave community in South Wales, Yorkshire, and Ireland, where he had previously dived, would really miss Roger Solari's joyful heart. Tell us the first thought that popped into your mind or the first question you had about Roger Solari's tragic death in the comments below. And if you like hearing real life mysteries, then don't forget to give the video a thumbs up and click on that subscribe button before you leave and hit that bell icon so you don't have a problem with finding us again and you never miss our upcoming episodes.